what I would like to do today is represent the concerns of some extraordinarily courageous and dignified children that I've had the privilege of working with in the last 20 or so years as a therapist at street level. I don't know whether people realize, but there are 1.5 million children a year being maltreated in Britain. This is the internationally recognized figure for child abuse in this country. However, only a fraction of these children get the support that they need. On average, 670,000 children a year are referred to child protection systems in this country. But a whole group of them, about 400,000 of them, receive assessments. And eventually, just under 49,000 end up with a child protection plan. When you have a child protection plan, you have to be allocated a social worker who has to see you regularly. And because of that, this costs local authorities money. So there is an intensive attempt to remove practically all these children off the child protection plan to make room for new children coming along. So just in under a year, almost all the children are removed, leaving some 2,700 children in year two. And if you look at the figures a bit more carefully, you will notice that 26% of these children had to be returned back on the register because they were prematurely removed. Of that 400,000 who get assessments, it's dependent on whether a local authority has the resources and the choices that local authority makes as to whether they get some kind of help or not. What that translates at street level is in poor areas, Children are being left without food. They're being left in conditions of living, which means that there is feces in their beds. We're walking into houses where you open the fridge and the rat, rat droppings have actually frozen into the ice. Children are being left in atrocious conditions because local authorities don't have the money to intervene. Because children don't vote, they're not able to hold politicians accountable. And even though politicians know and privately have said that children's social services in this country is not fit for purpose, none of them want to go and sort the situation out because it's not on the top of the priority list. And the general public, about whose vote they care, is unaware of just what kind of a time bomb we're sitting on. And therefore, the politicians, over a number of years, have got away with betraying these kids and not meeting their needs. Recently, we had independent evaluations at Kids' Company, and it was found that of the cohort of children who were assessed, one in five of them had been shot at and or stabbed. One in four of their parental carers and immediate family members had been shot at and stabbed. Children who come to our street-level centers, a third of them are presenting requiring a bed because they're sleeping on the floor and putting cardboard boxes on top of each other as a mattress. 18% don't have underwear. 16% don't have socks. 80% rely on their food, on us, and they want our evening meals, otherwise they will be left without food. 87% have been multiply traumatized, sexually and physically abused, and we can't even get them to the door of our mental health provisions because they're so underfunded, they do everything they can not to take a case. As neuroscience has advanced, we are now beginning to understand the repercussion and the implication of leaving children in conditions of chronic harm. When a child is growing up in a situation where they're constantly frightened, they release vast amounts of adrenaline and noradrenaline, 
without getting any kind of break from this fright condition. The adrenaline enters the emotional centers of the brain, the limbic system, deep inside the brain, and starts dysregulating the electrical and chemical activity in there. We've now got scanning ability that shows us that children who've been chronically maltreated have deficits in structure and functioning of key areas of their brains. And what the studies are showing is that our genes determine the boundaries of our development. My genes dictate that I won't grow wings and fly, but within that boundary, how we end up developing is entirely dependent on the conditions of care that we've been exposed to. So if you have in your gene the capacity for aggression and the capacity for kindness, if your environment is constantly demanding of you to negotiate circumstances of violence and violation, then that aspect of your gene that is responsible for negotiating aggression will get upregulated in the service of survival. And then epigeneticists believe that this alteration in expression becomes baseline genetic programming for the next generation. It is in this context that I believe we're sitting on a potentially lethal time bomb as the repercussions of violence begin not to impact just the children that are surviving them now, but potentially future generations, both in terms of the alterations in biological expression, but also in the impaired capacity of the parent to take care of their offspring in the future. What do we know? We know that we are operating in terms of our care structures based on a flawed premise. We believe that the fundamental construct is one in which if you morally educate a child, correct them through sanctions and reward them, that they will end up behaving appropriately. That structure is appropriate for someone who has an organized uh, cognitive capacity, can memorize sanctions, has enough control to exercise a full stop when they're about to do something wrong, and then use the memory of the sanction to prohibit themselves from doing the next wrong thing. But actually, children who've been chronically violated and have had very poor attachments have a double whammy damage that prevents them from making use of this moral construct appropriately. Firstly, your capacity to be pro-social is given to you because of the kind of attachment to relationships that you've been exposed to. Literally, that loving care that we've been given builds up the fabric of the brain in the frontal lobe. And it's our frontal lobe that we need in order to maintain our capacity for planning, our capacity to be empathetic, to consider somebody else's point of view, and to exercise personal control and regulate emotion and energy. So when the emotional centers of your brain are firing away and saying, what is this mad woman saying? Why doesn't she get off the stage? Your frontal lobe comes along and says, oh, she's doing a TED talk. She'll go in a minute. And in that way, you regulate yourself. But uh, your ability to regulate is absolutely there because of the care you've had. Children who've been impoverished because of lack of care don't develop robustly their capacities in the frontal lobe. In addition, the brain is constantly in a state of construction. And in adolescence, the frontal lobe rewires. So therefore, it is that much more weakened in the teenage years. And it's not until the 30s, the early 30s, that the full capacities of the frontal lobe uh, engage, re-engage again. So what have we got? We've got potentially the most vulnerable children, even those who've been well cared for, needing support in their teenage years. Those who haven't been well cared for have already vulnerabilities in the frontal lobe, but also because of the amount of fright 
that they're exposed to, and also the memorizing of horrific memories. When these children are violated, the adrenal glands release fright hormones. The fright hormones come along and encapsulate the whole event um, completely. So if they were abused by a purple-haired man, the color of his hair, the quality of his, the tone of his voice, his breath, the wild look in his eyes, everything is memorized and delivered straight away to the emotional centers of the brain. And what children describe is this situation where they feel constantly revved up, and also they're attempting to suppress these memories that they've banked in the emotional centers of their brain so that they can cope with the here and now. But the quality of the emotional potency of these memories is so high that you just need two or three incidents in the outside world or characteristics in the outside world to match one of these memories for that memory to unleash itself. So the four-year-old who was violated as a child sits on the bus as a 16-year-old, sees a man walking in, the man is abusive towards him on the bus, and that revenge that was stored in the four-year-old for the person who was going to abuse them is now unleashed on this individual on the bus. And it's in this context that people don't realize the kind of drivers that are in there in the brains of very disturbed children and how much these children are making an attempt to control these drivers and to manage them without appropriate levels of help. So what happens to a violated child is that there is an overdrive from the limbic system, there is an incapacity to coordinate emotion and cognition because there's been significant depletions in areas of the brain that are responsible for coordinating the brain's functioning. There is an incapacity for self-soothing and self-calming because the front part of the brain hasn't developed robustly as a result of lack of care. And then these children are left with experience of accumulative tension both at brain level, but also at cellular level, because the cells of the body code the harm that has been experienced. They don't code the narrative of it, but they code the harm. And then these children very soon realize that if they behave in a very aggressive way, either harming themselves through cutting or slamming their heads into walls, or if they get into a big fight and they get into an incident, that what they achieve is an evacuation of tension, both from the limbic system and at cellular level. And therefore, using violence as a way of evacuating tension becomes a way of calming yourself down. This is a difficulty that just doesn't impact the person who's experiencing it, but many of these children potentially go on to violate other children who never chose violence as a primary survival tool, never did, needed it, but nevertheless have to upregulate their capacity for violence to survive uh, the kind of child who's been violated. What we need to do is we need to understand that the paradigm shift is not in enhancing our moral education of these children, but giving these children the capacity to regulate their emotion and their energy, to exercise greater control over their disturbed energetic functioning. And that capacity can only be given to these children when they've been given the kind of quality care that comes from a parental function. You cannot replace the biological carer, but you can reparent violated children, allowing them the neurodevelopmental trajectory that they've been denied. This is the paradigm shift that we need to make in the delivery of care to vulnerable children in this country. And it's a lack of imagination, a lack of aspiration that is making our politicians deny these kids the kind of care they need. And all I want you to understand is that I never saw a child who chose to be a criminal or a killer. I've seen children who wanted to be pro-social, who wanted to achieve, but didn't have the emotional 
and the practical tools to attain that achievement. And surely, if we are a successful society, that's the least we owe to our vulnerable children. Thank you very much.